Friends, today's NRI Samai program from Los Angeles brought to you commercial free by listeners like you. Your generous donations make possible for us to stay commercial free. And today's show is pre recorded. If you have a question for the guest, please send an email to nri samai at gmail.com. We will follow up with the guest and find the answer for you. Thank you for your support. Welcome to all our listeners on NRI Samai. Uh, in July and September of uh, this year, two uh, Hindi journalists were arrested under charges of being uh, Maoist rebels and they were uh, subjected to custodial torture. Um, they were uh, Nag, who was an Adivasi journalist, and Yadav, who was an active reporter, and both were Gondi uh, and Hindi speaking, and hence they were uh, very much and connected with the uh, people on the ground, and they were bringing very, um, you know, crucial reporting uh, from on the ground, and they were uh, arrested on the charges of being Maoist rebels. And these two are now being represented by um, Jagdalpur Legal Aid Group, and one of their uh, members, uh, Shalini Gera, is with us. Uh, so we will talk about not just this one particular issue, but just in general, what uh, uh, this legal aid group uh, is doing in Jagdalpur uh, all by themselves, which is a very small group of uh, individuals, about four uh, 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 women, an entire women team. And uh, we will try to talk about uh, what's happening on the ground and how they came together and uh, help us understand what the ground situations are. So Sharani, thanks a lot for uh, being on the show today. Well, thank you for calling me. Thank you. Um, so, um, like, like I was t telling earlier, so Nag and Yadav, um, I understand from the reports uh, that uh, have been coming out, uh, they were arrested in July and September, and uh, you are uh, representing them. Could you just uh, uh, speak about uh, this uh, particular case? Yeah, so Somaru Nag is a tribal journalist in uh, Tiratkar in Darbha. Uh, block and uh, Santosh Yadav is another reporter um, from Darbha area. Um, so Maru Nag got picked up earlier in July and he was charged with participating in burning up a, a crusher plant. Um, there's a lot of mining that goes on in the area and crusher plants are frequently targeted by Naxalites. But he was charged with being involved in one of those attacks. and. So Maru Nag was picked up more recently, and he is, the police is claiming that he is involved in a police ambush in which one of the policemen died. Both of them are really serious charges, and we believe that both of them are being made, uh, both these journalists are being implicated in false cases, and this has more to do with the situation of Bastar, where independent free journalists are targeted. Um, and uh, this is a reflection of the conflict that's going on over there. Um, mm -hmm. I'd like to uh, bring out one facet of, uh, of Santosh Yadav's arrest, um, which I think has escaped some of the news reports that have come out. But it's very important to note that he was arrested um, from Darbha right after it was reported widely in the newspapers that about 150 to 200 villagers had come to Darbha to quote-unquote seek police protection against the Maoists. So there was a big, uh, uh, big police function going on in uh, Darbha at that time to felicitate this. Um, and this was a story that the police men put out. What was not said was that this village, the Bhadrimahu village, from where these 150 to 200 people were coming out, had been repeatedly targeted by the police in the previous two weeks by multiple uh, uh, search and patrolling missions, and many of their boys had been picked up and thrown into jail. And Santosh Yadav, one of the journalists, knew this. In fact, he was talking to some of the, of the boys had been picked up, and he knew they were getting picked up. And he was talking to these villagers, and he figured out that they had not voluntarily come to Darbha, um, but they had been lured there by the police, um, saying that if they came 
their boys would be freed. So it was this police promise that had lured these uh, villagers to come to Darpa. And it was this story that the police did not want breaking out. The police was putting forth the story that these villagers were coming voluntarily to seek police protection, while actually these villagers had been lured to come with promises that their uh, boys would be freed. And it was this story that the police probably didn't want breaking out, which is why Santosh Yadav got arrested and charged with mm -hmm. a heinous crime of actually attempting to kill um, a policeman. And these are the stories. This is how reporting becomes such a dangerous uh, um, dangerous occupation in this conflict region where truth is actually held hostage to all these interests. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what has uh, happened to Santosh Yadav and Sumaru Nag? Um, is this um, an isolated uh, case or uh, is this something uh, ongoing and hence it's a reflection of the conflict uh, in uh, Bastar, Dantewara and other Naxal affected areas in Chhattisgarh? Um, this is very much an ongoing thing. Uh, we have very few people who at this point are willing to speak out. There is a reign of terror and people are scared of speaking out. Therefore, it's like really very few people who have the courage to speak out and tell the story as it is, as was there with uh, the two journalists we're speaking about. And uh, But every time there are these kind of journalists, they get targeted. And uh, they're always, uh, it's not only the police in the past, we've also seen that um, the two journalists in the recent past were also killed by Maoists. So there is a... Truth is often um, very difficult to get out in these areas. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'd like to say that even before this, there was a celebrated case of Lingaram Kudopi, who is uh, Sony Sori's nephew. Right. When he and Sony Sori were picked up, he was also a journalist. He was also a tribal journalist, bringing out the truth of the Tarmitla, uh, Tarmitla encounters, where three villages were burned down by the CRPF forces and people killed and uh, women sexually assaulted. So the tribal journalists tend to be a particular target of the police because they sometimes have advantages like uh, knowledge of the language and knowledge of customs, which makes them actually more effective in getting the truth out of the villages. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, they pose a particular threat to um, the police that maybe non-tribal journalists do not pose, as a result of which we hardly have any working tribal journalists in the area anymore. Every time a few people come up, they're rudely crushed. Mm -hmm. Now, is this uh, uh, always the case that the police are... Uh, threatening these uh, Adivasi journalists, or they also face similar kind of threat from the Maoists? Well, we are aware that at least two journalists in the recent past, Naimi Chen Jain and Sai Reddy, uh, were targeted by the Maoists. Mm -hmm. So I think, yes, journalists do, uh, do uh, run the... Um, they, they do have uh, threats from both sides. Mm -hmm. And I think in a conflict region, you're always going to find that kind of uh, things. Um, usually, uh, uh, the way the Geneva Convention, etc. goes, in such areas of conflict, um, journalists should have immunity from both sides because they play a very important role of bringing mm -hmm. up the truth, which everybody needs to know. And again, if any conversations or talks have to be held between the two sides, it's only journalists who can carry messages from one area, from one side to the other. So they have to be given that kind of immunity. And uh, that's uh, what the journalists in the area are now fighting for, that they should be exempt from these kind of restrictions. And they should be encouraged, in fact, to go out and get the truth and report the truth. And that will allow the society, allow space for dialogue within the society about what is the situation and where um, people want to go. Um, and in fact, right after the two journalists um, uh, were recently picked up by the police, there's been a massive campaign by the uh, local journalists in Chhattisgarh. Yesterday, there was a big uh, protest demonstration in Raipur. 
and that is what they're demanding that these draconian laws under which which with, with which um, under which the journalists are getting picked up they be exempted under those draconian laws and not be held responsible just if they're having conversations with the Maoists because they need to have those conversations with the Maoists. Mm. Similarly, after the two journalists were killed last year, um, the local journalists took out a padyatra, a foot march, all along Bastar uh, with a message to the Maoists that again, they have to be exempted from the Maoists diktats and their violence because again journalists play a very special role in this conflict. Right, right. Now uh, how many journalists are we talking uh, here Sharani? And because understanding uh, that this is a very intense uh, kind of operation that, that's going on on the ground, um, I'd be surprised if this is like a very um, you know, uh, uh, a viable profession that anyone will choose to knowing fully that it's uh, highly uh, risk uh, taking. How many journalists, both Gondi speaking and Hindi speaking journalists, are there currently in these areas? Just a ballpark. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you the exact numbers. I'd say that the Gondi speaking journalists, especially, are just a mere handful. Mm. I wouldn't put their numbers you know, maybe double digits at best. But again, mm -hmm. the word journalist we're using a little bit more expansively. So what we have over here are people who are stringers, who mm -hmm. are getting the news and passing it on to the editors, and the editor might then put somebody else to cover the news. These are not the people whose name you might necessarily see in a byline. Mm -hmm. um, but these are the local people who are gathering the news and who are keeping tabs on the situation and passing along information to their right. citizens. Uh, etc. Right, so right. in that way the numbers are plentiful in the area. Mm. Um, they might not, many of these people are not even on the roles, on the, uh, on the formal roles of uh, a newspaper. They might not even, many times the newspapers don't even give them an official press card, which is mm. why their role becomes even more difficult because it's sometimes very difficult for them to even prove that they're a journalist when they get picked up by the police, um, mm -hmm. etc. But it is very much their role that they have to gather the news and send it across. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that the, the actual number of journalists in the area, even though it's a very tough and a dicey uh, occupation, mm -hmm. um, I'm talking about, uh, you know, around 100. Um, but again, I'm saying that this is a very expansive definition. Um, but nevertheless, these are extremely important people when it comes to gathering news and... Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, making sure that information is widely um, available. Mm -hmm. And when you said uh, you know there was a big rally taken out in Raipur, um, are these just journalists from local or the journalists from nearby states uh, who also um, or bordering states who have also taken part in this? Well, uh, so this was all from Chhattisgarh, but it was definitely not just Basta journalists. Mm. So while the threat is most keenly felt by those in Basta, this rally was held in the capital city of Raipur, and they mm. had uh, people from uh, uh, surrounding districts and all across the state who came out in solidarity of their uh, fellow brethren who were mm. under direct threat. Mm -hmm. um, so is this, is this only uh, journalists then who are under this uh, threat from both the police and the Maoists, or do you see that uh, even the tribal population, even the Adivasis, uh, are also somewhat uh, threatened by either side. Well, uh, you know, at this point, this is a conflict situation we're talking about. Mm. So yes, the population is l at large is definitely involved in the conflict, and it's it's definitely um, you know violence is an integral part of a conflict, and so yes, the population is under threat. Mm. Um, when we're talking about uh, special danger to people, then we are talking about everybody who is speaking out or not playing according to some rules. Mm. And this would include the journalists for sure. It includes social activists like we had Sony Sori, a tribal activist who was again picked up and subjected to intense torture. Mm. Um, we have uh, other professionals, like Himanshu Kumar, I'm sure you know about. He had a whole, he was running a uh, social service center and again he was rooted out because he started opposing the salvage room. Mm -hmm. In the past we've had doctors thrown out of there, both ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross and MSF. 
they were thrown out by the state saying that these were uh, supporting the next lights. And as of right now, um, lawyers, our legal aid group is under threat because uh, we have been barred as of last week of, of uh, participating in the Buster District Courts. So I'd say that, yes, uh, it, it is a very fraught situation. And uh, various people are getting targeted in very many ways. Civil liberties, per se, is under a big threat in the area. Mm. And uh, so it's a security situation where security tends to have the upper hand in every discourse, and people's rights and liberties get trampled upon. Mm-hmm. And typically, what kind of charges are put on? Now, journalists, I can understand that because they are, uh, you know, some is bringing out the stories. Uh, uh, they are either against the state missionary, or they might be saying, "Hey, you are, uh, you know, working with the Maoists." But the tribal population, what are some of the charges that are, uh, you know, uh, on them, and how or, or under what circumstances would the police actually uh, pick them up? So what we are seeing is, in fact, that uh, the Buster um, jails, they're overflowing with Adivasis who've been picked up en masse and on charges of being Naxalite supporters. Mm. Um, so they are, uh, I, so the many ways in which they're picked up, there are a few targeted pickups like uh, Sony Sori or Santoshi Adav. Those are actually by far much more rarer cases when people are target uh, when the police is targeting a particular individual that they don't like. Usually, what we are coming across is these random arrests. Um, a large posse of the security forces they would go into the villages, seeing these people come. Most of the villagers would simply flee and abandon their houses and run into the jungles. But for some reason, of a few, especially men. Um, are uh, left behind and they come in the way of the security forces, they're just picked up, taken up, and charged with being Naxalites or Naxalite supporters. Um, we are seeing uh, a lot of, uh, we, in many cases, um, there are uh, secret informers. One never knows who they are and what information they have, but the police has a whole body of uh, local villagers whom they are calling secret informers. And uh, God knows what information these secret informers give them, but on their basis, we are seeing a whole set of other tribals being picked up also as Maxlite informers. Mm-hmm. Now, this information can never uh, be challenged because one doesn't even know who it is, and many times it's personal problems, uh, personal differences with others that get uh, colored as uh, secret information that this person is a Maxlite info- is a Maxlite supporter. And so we're seeing all kinds of things happening in this place. A lot of people, um, I mean, the vast majority of people in Dantewara Jail and Jagdalpur uh, Central Jail are uh, being uh, um, imprisoned on charges, unproven charges of being um, Mm -hmm. Nakhlet supporters. When finally their trials uh, actually end, most of them get released, most of them get acquitted. But unfortunately, these trials take several years to finish. And that's where the judiciary break in the whole system breaks down, that we pick up, uh, the state picks up people on unfounded charges, subjects mm. them to a long and grueling process of a trial. Uh, at the end of the day, just to say that they're, not, they're innocent and not guilty. But in that process, the entire um, life, you know, has been destroyed for the person right. in jail. The family has, you know, run from pillar to post, trying to get legal help, trying to get all kinds of help. And uh, they ended up spending several years. Usually they, they are young men or young women. And uh, the the outcome of this kind of incarceration is really uh, gruesome mm. on those uh, family and the villages. Mm. So given uh, the number of uh, people languishing in these jails for years and years, how would uh, your group, the Jagdalpur Legal, uh, Legal Aid Group, um, you know, would uh, decide on uh, which cases to work on, which people to support, and whose cases you would be fighting for? Yeah, so when we started out, 
um, because we were pretty new and we hardly knew anybody. We actually did RTI applications with jails um, mm. to see who were the longest serving under trials. And this and was how many years ago? Uh, we started out in July 2013. Okay. So it's a little over two, two years ago. Right. And so we did these RTI applications just to get names of people who were the longest serving under trials. And once we got them, we would run after we would run after their lawyers because by this time they're spending six, seven years in jail. They already had lawyers. Most of them were legal aid lawyers who were appointed, you know, because these people were too poor to have their own private lawyers. So this was, mm. these were lawyers appointed by the state. Um, and most of the time there was a lot of indifference to these trials. Uh, the legal aid lawyers were not being particularly attentive to these cases, and so these cases were dragging on forever. So we would offer to the lawyer that we would, you know, help them out in these cases um, for free. Um, surprisingly, a lot of lawyers did not want us at our help, mm -hmm. and so they would say, "No, thank you. We don't want you around." And even though the people in jail sometimes would want our help, um, it would be crazy because uh, we couldn't really help them till the lawyers allowed us to. Right. Um, and, but in some cases, we did, the lawyers did say, sure, help us, and so we could start helping them. Once we started this process, and we would visit the jails very often to meet with these people and find out uh, what was, uh, what was, you know, what the cases were, what their story of the case was, etc., word spread in the jail. And soon we had people in jail reaching out to us and saying, can you please take up my case? Can you, you know, I'm here mm. for so many years, etc. Can you please help me out? And again, um, I'd say that we wanted to help out many people, but we couldn't because they had their own lawyers appointed, and many times it was not possible for us to help. Mm. Um, uh, but it was just by word of mouth that, um, the, that it went out that we were there. And... Uh, then, um, as of this year, a few, you know, we have now started taking up cases right from the beginning. The word has gone out in the villages that we are willing to fight cases. Mm. And so many times now we are being called as soon as somebody gets picked up. And we get a call, Didi, my, you know, my son's been picked up, please help me out. And then we start from the beginning rather than, you know, working at the end where they've already spent six years in jail. Now we're mm -hmm. starting with them from the beginning as soon as they get picked up. Mm -hmm. And you also said that you offer free legal uh, support for them, right? Um, right, right? So how, how, I mean, given that it's almost three years since you have been operating, how, would, how are you sustaining yourself uh, financially so you're able to help out uh, all these people? Yeah, so uh, we're a small group and we have a very modest operation. And so up till now, we've, we've, got, we've been lucky to get the help of a few C, uh, Supreme Court advocates who are mm -hmm. offering uh, all the lawyers in our group uh, fellowships, individual fellowships. Um, so we have managed to, uh, you know, our needs are taken care of by those fellowships that the Supreme Court advocates mm -hmm. are giving us. And mm -hmm. uh, for the general operation, there have been friends and family who have been pitching out. So mm -hmm. we kind of managed to stay afloat. Mm -hmm. uh, you also mentioned, I think uh, briefly touched upon that even your group is also coming under the threat because now you're helping the people fight their cases, uh, so you're facing a similar kind of a threat. Now this threat is, is, is it coming from the state missionary, the Maoists, or the, or, or, or the police? Who exactly is this threat from? Well, since we are working within the state mechanism, um, mm. so at this point, we represent a threat to the state. Um, mm. So um, we are seeing um, threats coming to us from largely the police and uh, more recently from the lawyer community. So uh, in the past, the police has um, gone, gone around uh, the, the IG, uh, the Inspector General of Police of Buster Range. Uh, he's been making statements that our group is nothing more than a Maoist front, mm. and, uh, he's even, and that the police is looking at us very closely, and we're going to be picked up and put behind prison very soon. Um, so this is probably just meant to intimidate us, because I think that if they had anything against us, 
then any reasonable police officer would actually act on it rather than going ahead just making uh, mm -hmm. statements. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there was also a police complaint against us. So it was an anonymous complaint, um, and it said that we did not have the right credentials to practice in the area and that we were probably just forging our credentials. Mm. So it was a very stupid complaint and it should not have actually been followed up at all because it was an anonymous complaint. Yet the police followed it up really diligently and even though we met, went and met the SP and everything, uh, it didn't help and you know we, uh, we have repeatedly given all our certificates etc. to the police. But the threat is not going, I mean, the, the complaint is not going away. They keep saying, no, they have to investigate more and more of the complaints. So they're going around talking to all lawyers, all f friends, etc., just to, quote, unquote, inquire into this complaint. Mm -hmm. I don't know how long it will go on. Um, mm -hmm. But more recently, as of last week, you were very surprised, um, but the Buster um, District Bar Association, which is, just a group of lawyers uh, that, that practice in these courts, they took out a resolution um, saying that we are prohibited from practicing in the Buster courts. Um, the excuse they're using is that we are not registered in the Chhattisgarh State Bar Council, but actually the Advocates Act allows anyone to, who is registered in any state bar council to practice all over India. And we, as we have told them repeatedly, we are registered in the Delhi Bar Council. But anyway, they, they're using this to actually ban us from mm -hmm. uh, practicing in the district bar courts. Um, I must say that ever since this uh, statement was made public, we've received a lot of support from around India. A lot mm -hmm. of groups, lawyers, law students, law faculty have written to us offering support. And we're in the process of challenging this resolution. But again, this is just a sheer you know, a tactic of harassment, and it takes away from the work that we're really here to do. True. Um, you know, we start battling with threats on us, we really are less effective and then working for the Adivasi community, which was our basic aim of being here. Mm. But nevertheless, I think this is just one more facet of the struggle that's going on over here, the struggle to free up the space, um, a civic space where people can actually talk and work freely. Mm -hmm. So three years ago, when you start, decided to start this group or, or join the group, rather, um, what was your uh, thought process? Like, why did you even want to do this? And what was your background prior to that? Um, so actually, um, this is law is my second career. Um, I was uh, a researcher and, uh, uh, you know, had a corporate job. Um, before this in a completely different field. Um, but uh, I had moved on uh, from there realizing that I was less interested in corporate world and I wanted to make myself, uh, I wanted to devote more time to social movements and political work. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but at that time I was um, just starting out and um, I had decided to get into law and I was uh, studying law uh, when uh, I was interning with the Human Rights Law Network in, uh, in Delhi, when the case of Sony Sori came um, mm. to them. And at that time, I got involved in this case, um, which put me in touch with a lot of other lawyers and the legal fraternity that was actually looking at some of these issues. And um, at that time, there were discussions that came about as to how uh, really we knew so little about what the legal situation was in Buster. Everybody knew there was a conflict going on over there, but people had very little idea of what the conflict was doing to the legal situation and um, how the criminal justice system was responding to this. Um, from Sony Sori's case, actually a lot of us learned of new things that were happening in Buster we realized what kind of cases people were being um, roped into. And Sony Sori's case was not just one case, we realized that she had another six cases lodged against her. And in each one of the six cases, there were some 20, 25 other tribals who were there with her too. So we realized this was a very widespread problem that was plaguing the tribal society and that we needed to understand it much more. So there were a series of discussions held and different uh, 
lawyers were talking about it and how a group like ours needed to be set up um, in Buster to understand what the situation was and to decide on what legal interventions could be made. So I just happened to be there at the right time, and this is definitely my interest in social justice. And so I kind of got into this group, but this group emerged after many discussions, and it's not just the three or four of us who started, but it came out of discussions of a lot of people and the support of a lot of people mm-hmm. who are interested in issues. Mm-hmm. So given um, uh, what is happening now, uh, and when you look back uh, three years ago, you think you have made the right decision? Do you ever reflect upon that? Oh, oh, definitely. I think um, I think we all knew it was going to be very challenging when we mm. came in. Um, we had already, I mean, as I said, it, we just didn't walk into it blind. There were other people helping and guiding us. Uh, we had the experience of Himan Shuji um, to think about. We had the experience of Nandini Sundar. Um, so we knew how challenging the situation was. Mm. And we knew that we needed, uh, and there was, but we also had the goodwill of people over there. A lot of uh, people like Himanshu Ji, Siddha Bharadwaj, Nandini Sundar had all worked in the area and there were people who were supporting them in that work. And so when we went over there, we actually had their goodwill also to help us through. So we kind of were part of a process and yes, we knew it was going to be difficult, but uh, we also knew why we were there. And even today, I think that is what sustains us, however hostile a situation we find ourselves in. Um, the fact is that there are really many, many people fighting over there and fighting for justice, and they're not giving up, and they're facing far graver situations than we are. And it is their fight that sustains us there and gives us energy to proceed. So I think, yes, those uh, decisions still hold, and uh, we are very happy that we are part of this fight as well. Great. Awesome. Uh, one last question before I let you go. I know it's uh, pretty late uh, in India right now. Um, so if any um, one of us, uh, the listeners or anyone else, uh, uh, would like to help in any way financially or any other thing that you could think of, is there an avenue for that? And if so, how can they do that? Okay, so uh, in terms of financially, yes, we always... Uh uh, I mean, we are a cash-strapped group, as, as are all groups over here, but we cannot accept donations from outside of India. Mm-hmm. So, um, and actually, um, lack of res- lack of money has not stopped us from doing anything so mm-hmm. far. Mm-hmm. So it's not a biggest challenge, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, you can always write to us and we can, uh, our email address is Jagdalpur Legal Aid Group at gmail.com. And we can, uh, you know, that's always. We are always encouraging people to visit us. So if there mm. are people who are interested in knowing more about the situation and would like to come and visit us, um, we would be more than happy to host them. And we encourage visitors to come. I mean, that I think one of the ways to learn about the situation is actually to be here. Mm. And one of the ways by which the situation gets really bad is because um, those things are, are happening in closed spaces. The more people visit and understand the situation, the more discourse there is, that there is about what is actually happening on the ground, I think the m- more we'll find ways to um, deal with it. So we're always encouraging people to come by and visit. Um, um, in addition to that, I think uh, there are at this point uh, many stories coming out of, a few stories coming out of Pasta. And I think keeping oneself involved and informed about the situation um, is the first step, and that helps uh, to take any of these fights and struggles onwards. So, again, uh, if you would like to get involved, write to us, and we can explore further what your situ- what your uh, um, interests are and how they would mesh. But in general, I, we will be always encourage people to come and visit and to read about. Uh, the situation in Buster. Thank you, Shalini. Uh, listeners, so you've heard from Shalini. Uh, you can write to 
their group directly uh, using Jagdalpur Legal Aid Group at gmail.com. And if you're in India, certainly pay a visit to them and learn more about the ground situation. Uh, and Shalini, thank you very much for being on the show, and uh, we wish you the very best of everything. Thank you, Suresh. Thank you. Friends, if you liked today's show, please go to youtube.com forward slash NRA Same and click on the subscribe button. You will get notified every time we publish a new show. And you can also like us on our social media sites like Facebook.